Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another edition of the show. I'm here with Brian Sullivan of Gaducia Cellars and uh, he's been very kind enough to take some moment, take some time out of his busy day today. Uh, we've got a bunch of people coming into the tasting room and uh, we're going to talk about Gaducia, we're going to talk about Jerome, talk about you and and uh, we'll um, some fascinating stuff here up in Jerome. So uh, Brian, why don't we start off with you, tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got to Jerome. Ah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, when I was a young man, I decided to hitchhike around the country uh, to see where I'd like to live when I grew up or grew up. Right. I'm not sure that I have yet. <laughs> I don't but, think I'm uh, either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, one evening uh, on a hot July uh, day, somebody dropped me off right outside the window here, uh, and that's how I discovered Jerome. But uh, of course, the tasting room wasn't here back then. Right. And. Uh, I had no idea that it ever would be or that I would be living in Jerome, but 15 years later I found myself back here living with a, a business and uh, all kinds of things to keep my life uh, very hectic from right. the get-go. So uh, you came back and uh, you started up a cafe? I did, yeah. I, uh, I've been a business owner, I think, ever since the day I stepped foot in Jerome for the second time. Right. Uh, uh, three days after I arrived here with a U-Haul truck full of belongings, I, uh, I went to work, you know, owning a business. And okay. At the time, there was uh, no place to rent in town, but I knew that Jerome was the place that one had to live if one lived in this area, because this is a, a little bastion of uh, liberality and a sea of... Republicans, <laughs> right? <laughs> but uh, so uh, to make a long story short, uh, there was no place to rent, so I went down to the local uh, campground on the Verde River and started my business from a picnic table on the campground. I'd go home at night to the campground, count the money, uh, do paperwork. Right. Uh, it took a, a couple of months to settle into Jerome. Okay. So uh, you had this cafe for a while, and you had. You, this is you had done. You've been in restaurants for a while. So you start off as a busboy, right? Right. Twenty years, right? Probably, or more now in the restaurant yeah. business. So and I mean, I, I start off as a dishwasher. So right. <laughs> and it's good to learn stuff from the ground up. Right. And exactly. Uh, yeah. um, so um, you were doing that for a while, but let's let's kind of go back to where how Jerome and and what was the kind of the town history? Because you said you were kind of like the kind of somewhat of a historian here. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I didn't tell you this earlier, but okay. uh, I used to be the guy uh, with two huge Belgian mares attached to a wagon uh, giving <laughs> oh, nice. tours on the streets of Jerome amidst all this traffic, sometimes right. on holiday weekends. You know, there would be six cars running at the stop sign right. with exhaust fumes coming out, and then me <laughs> with my two mares and wagon talking to the and cars behind me you know right so, yeah so uh, on the uh, hilly streets of jerome it was pretty hairy sometimes uh, traveling around with two horses <laughs> right well I, I know we experienced that that hill we missed the sign that says your gps is wrong so if you ever get to here um apple maps i'm not sure about google maps is probably the same do not turn on gulch road just stay on main and then you'll get here okay <laughs> do not go on gulch road if you want to yeah. stay in, uh, on good terms with the with the neighbors the people who live here <laughs> yeah very hilly and very narrow and dirt and uh tires spun a few times so yeah stay on main but um so yeah so jerome kind of talk about the history of jerome so yeah so uh in the wagon with the horses i would tell the tourists the history of jerome uh, which uh, started out as a mining town uh, of 15 to 20,000 people uh, with all different uh, strata of society. There was an opera house here in Jerome. 
uh, right across the street there. Okay. The foundation. Uh, traveling shows from around the country would come and perform for uh, the miners. Uh, there was uh, up above us on what's called Company Hill or some large Victorian houses. All right. Those were houses that were occupied by the managers, the owners of the mines, the, the higher ups. Uh, all of the miners were spread out in various communities down the hill, usually ethnically separated, like there's Mexican town, there's a Croatian town. Uh, right. So all of these different ethnicities were here mining, 15 to 20,000 of them, including their families. Tons of bars uh, throughout town, uh, right. bordellos. Uh, this particular spot we're in, uh, where the tasting room is now, used to be called John's Place in the 20s. It was a, a bar um, with the same footprint as the bar we have now that we cool. use for wine tasting. Um, but uh, all that uh, money made, it was a billion dollar copper town uh, along they say that enough silver and gold came out of the ground uh, to pay for all of the operations to extract a billion dollars worth of copper. Okay. Um, but all of that ended in the 50s uh, when the mines closed down, 1953 to be exact. Uh, a lot of houses were put on you know, wheels and hauled down the hill to Clarkdale and Cottonwood, and they're there to this day. That's amazing, considering how we drove up here, so. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> And uh, uh, for the most part, anybody who needed to make a living had to leave. There was right. nothing to do here, no economy other than mining, back in those days, back in the 50s. Uh, and then Jerome turned into a ghost town at that point, with only about uh, 50 to 100 people staying here. Um, the only people that could stay were people who had uh, incomes, like retirement incomes, or who might be a school teacher down in the next town. So okay. anything, uh, anything having to do with mining, everybody left. Right. Um, but then uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, some of the counterculture people started moving here. Those people that we now refer to as hippies. Um, and with that, they started to try to create an economy uh, based around arts and crafts and, and such, uh, and bartering labor back and forth, um, fixing up houses. And from that uh, slow beginning, uh, developed uh, what's now known as the Jerome Arts Community, uh, where we're pretty well known as an arts destination. Okay. Uh, and beyond that, uh, in comes the wine industry on top of that, and finally gives us something I think to hold on to, whereas before in Jerome, being a tourist town, all there were were t-shirt shops and uh, the shops that sold, and we always laugh about this, cans of fartless beans, <laughs> and, uh, stuff like that, just right. tourist crap, but uh, now I feel with the influx of wine people, wine appreciators, Right, winemakers, vineyards. I think we have something new going on here. Nice. Um, so, how did you get involved with? Well, let's 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 talk more, more Caduceus. So, how did Caduceus get started? Uh, well, I was around. Um, you were around back then. Yeah, I was around <laughs> back then. Um, Maynard, uh, who was the owner of Caduceus, Maynard Keenan. Uh, I met him in my cafe one morning and it took me a long time to warm up to him. I, I heard that he was a rock and roll star. Yeah. And I'm like a lot of other people in Jerome. It's like, whoa, you know, <laughs> this is a small town. We don't need you Hollywood types. <laughs> right. And uh, he proved himself over time to be a loyal friend and customer. And uh, one day after as he often did, traveling around the world on tour for his, uh, on, in the music industry. In the music industry, band. right, yeah. Uh, he came back, this was about five years after he moved here, maybe around the year 1999 or 2000, and said that he, you know, he had always been an appreciator of nice wines and would like to try wines from around the world, no matter what location he was in. And uh, came to believe from looking at the terroir, over there in places like Tuscany and uh, France, Spain. Uh, why can't I grow grapes back in Jerome where I live? Uh, where the soil and the terrain looks much the same right, as it does over here in Europe. Uh, and 
And, you know, from that point, researching backwards, you know, it was uh, obvious that uh, uh, all of those ethnic groups that had come to Jerome to mine or to work in the mines, you know, brought with them their their previous experience of having, you know, lived in villages or towns where growing grapes was quite the norm and, and a lot of them when they came here to Jerome or the Verde Valley had been growing grapes way back in the 20s and 30s. And of course all of that was shut down by prohibition. Right. So by the time, you know, history comes around to our generation, we've forgotten all about the fact that grapes used to be grown here. Uh, but why not? Right. Exactly. I always say uh, the desert is a wonderful place to grow anything as long as you can water it. Right. And that's the big problem. And, you know, grapes need water, but we also don't want them to have too much water. True. Right. So uh, I don't think that's a problem in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, you know, driving through Arizona and even through California, I was asleep in New Mexico, but it was dark. So there was nothing to see in New Mexico. On the way back to San Antonio, um, yes, we drove. If, if, that, if you didn't catch that in the last six episodes, <laughs> that we drove from San Antonio to California and now we're on, on the way back. Um, I expect to see some more of New Mexico on, on the trip back today. But, um, you know, there, there's still a surprising amount of vegetation that does survive in a desert. I mean, plants will find the water if it's there. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty amazing you know, what, what you do see driving around. And if, and if the water isn't there, they'll throw off their, their leaves or their coat of green until there is a little bit of water. Right. Suddenly they'll green up again. Exactly. So, um, so Maynard, you know, he's here and he's saying, okay, well, why not? You know, if, I, if they can grow the grapes in Tuscany and Spain and France, and it looks pretty similar to here. Maybe France not as much. It's not as deserty, but yeah, there's still there's still the hills and all that. Um, at least the part of France I've been in wasn't mm -hmm. as deserty, but I know Spain for sure. I know how the Tuscan area looks. Um, you know, why not, right? Why not grow the grapes here? And like you said, the Croatians and all of them had um, had grown grapes here, and it was kind of forgotten. So he says, okay, let's let's do that. Um, so that starts around, what, 2000? Uh, around the year 2000 was the first I ever heard uh, in an early morning cafe exchange <laughs> over coffee that, uh, hey, Brian, I think that I'm gonna terrace my hillsides and grow some grapes here in Jerome. Right. Well, of course, we all looked at him like he was crazy. Like, who does that? Exactly. Uh, but he proceeded at that point to uh, dig big holes in the ground, uh, which were required to have the soils tested and brought in people from universities and whoever was expert in their field to determine whether his soil was uh, amenable to grape growing or whether his soil was poisonous to grape growing. Right. And it turned out that he got some good reports, uh, started planting. Uh, the, first, uh, the first fruit arrived in 2004. Okay. So. And so he's got the vineyards up here. He also has vineyards uh, throughout the state. So there's a vineyard here in Jerome uh, known as the Judith Vineyard, which is our probably most prized property as far as notoriety. Okay. Uh, we make a wine from the Judith Vineyard uh, that sells here for $125 a bottle. Okay. It's called Judith. Uh, it's Tempranillo and Cabernet at the present time. It could be anything that comes out of that vineyard. The wine is named after the vineyard. Uh, which is named after Maynard's mother. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why it's special to his heart. And uh, uh, so there are two acres of vineyard up here in Jerome, which is not much. But if there were more, uh, the town of Jerome would probably uh, kick and squeal about it because they don't even like the fact that there's one vineyard here because they're worried about water. Right. It is uh, a valid, valid concern, right? It is. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It's <laughs> a know. long story. But, right. And uh, then there are about uh, 40 acres of vineyard right below us in the beautiful, I hope you get a shot of it, Verde Valley. Uh, right. Um, along the creeks and rivers, like along Oak Creek, are, are most of our properties. And I, I wanted to backtrack uh, to a couple of paragraphs ago where we were talking about the desert. Right. And how deserty it is, unless it's watered. But uh, most of our vineyards, to tell the truth, are along Oak Creek and the Verde River. And it's a little beautiful, green, riparian area where things aren't quite so deserted. Right, yeah. Um, a matter of fact, um, 
the biggest problem with having vineyards along Oak Creek, for instance, is that, um, well, for instance, we're a thousand feet higher than they are down there in the valley, but it gets colder down there mm -hmm. because of the river. Right. So the problem with our vineyards down there that we don't have up here is frost damage. Right. Uh, caused by that moisture. So. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so so then so there are 40 acres of vineyards <laughs> down below us in the right. Liberty Valley, and then uh, on down south, about 300 miles uh, diagonal southeast from here, in the southeastern corner of Arizona, where it butts up against New Mexico, uh, we have about 80 acres there as well. Okay. Very nice. Um, so, uh, been producing wine for, for about 14 years now. Ish. Well, uh, maybe more close to 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. But having the vineyards for for that while. Um, <coughs> so it's 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 pretty interesting that that um, uh, he's been making the wine here. Um, just you don't really think about Arizona as as a as a wine destination, but it's starting to become a, uh, it's starting to have some more wineries. You said earlier there might be. Close to 100 wineries in the state. Mm -hmm. Coming online, probably yeah. coming yeah. up to about 100. Yeah. Okay. At this um, point, you know, and, and you know, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to stop by here because yeah. nobody talks about Arizona. <laughs> I mean, barely people talk about Texas. So right. <laughs> you know, and Texas has, I think we're at somewhere between two and 300 wineries, bond, what they call bonded wineries. So they may not have any vineyards. They may just, you know. You know, contract with other growers. They may import juice from other places, but they but they make wine there, so right. they're considered a winery. Um, so I mean, it's still outside of California, um, Oregon, Washington, and New York State. There's really a very small amount of wine made in the United States. And uh, hearing about Caduceus, and since I knew I was be driving kind of close by, I thought you know, it'd be kind of cool if I was able to stop up here and check it out. Well, I like to uh, think back to this comparison, and, and I don't know if I'm co completely correct in it, but it seems to me to make sense. Um, when I, I moved to Seattle in 1982, okay, and at that point in Washington, you didn't really hear much about wine. Right. It was almost a new industry at that point. Now, I'm sure it had been going for a while, but as far as public perception, people didn't really think a whole lot about Washington wines. And uh, so, especially in Seattle, where it doesn't really exist, it's all in the east. Yeah, 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 in the east. east yeah, yeah. I, I do the same thing, I think, because it's dry in, in, cause it's very dry yeah, in eastern yeah. Washington, I think it's the west and it's not. Opposite, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but the comparison for me is that, so here we are, you know, a generation later, and I'm living in Arizona, and the wine industry feels at the point here that it did to me then mm -hmm. in 1982 in Washington. And you can see where Washington has come. Right. And I feel like Arizona is headed in the, in the same direction as far as notoriety, but perhaps not in quantity. Right. Because I think because of our desert climate and water restrictions, that our focus will be more on quality rather than quantity. Right. So I think you're going to see our bottles remain, you know, on the pricier end of the spectrum mm -hmm. because of that. Um, but it's all good. Right. Okay. Exactly. Um, so let's let's get into some of the wine here. Uh, we have picked uh, three wines to uh, to uh, try out and. Um, we've got yeah. a couple Arizona and we have a New Mexico wine, right? Right. I wanted to give a little variety. Uh, the first is a uh, one of our wine club selections. Our wine club is the Velvet Slippers Club. You can okay. find out about it all online. Yeah, we'll have a club. link. We'll have a link definitely <laughs> below for, for the for Caduceus. Uh, so this is 100% Sangiovese. We produce this right here in Yavapai County, so very close to home. This comes from the Marzo Block Vineyard down there on Oak Creek, okay. uh, which we were just talking about that had the the frost problems sometimes. All right. So Sangiovese, so I mean, I see that we've got a couple Italian varietals here. We'll, we'll get to this, I'm sure, but um, so again, talking about what 
what we would see out in Italy in the type of ter terroir. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just uh, coincidentally, I picked three wines that are all Italian varieties. Okay. Uh, uh, so I've got a Sangiovese here, I've got a, a Sangiovese Cabernet and Barbera blend, Okay. and I have a 100% Montepulciano as well. Well, and I know that, it, so, so how I even first heard of, of Caduceus was, was a, there's a documentary um, that, that kind of gives a, you know, a brief snapshot, I would say probably a good... Blood into wine. Yeah, blood into wine, kind of a snapshot of, of the time of, of the documentary. Right. Um, and what I do have to say is it pretty much was strictly just, it was exactly, it, there was no Hollywood from what I can tell in the documentary. I mean, there was no like, there was no dram dramatization, it looked like, you know. Uh -huh. um, but. There was a lot of comedy. Yeah, a lot of comedy. Yeah, there's yeah, it's interesting. Okay, um, but um, in my in my day job, which again we don't say where I work, we just know that I work for a restaurant. Um, I was at a portfolio tasting in Austin, and the distributor, who's Pioneer, um, uh, Chris was there showing the wines. So that Chris was my is our national sales representative. Yeah, yeah. and so. She was there showing uh, the wine, so because I had at least heard of it, I was like, well, at least now I can get to taste the wine. And what I did notice was definitely a lot of um, Italian varietals were being used, so I thought that was very interesting. Again, um, not you would not necessarily think about that, but even Texas, Texas wine industry mostly is the French varietals, the ones that everybody knows. Uh -huh. Cab, Merlot, Chardonnay, that type of stuff. Um, lots of debate whether they're, they should be grown in Texas or not, but there's a, Texas is a big state, you know, you, you can definitely grow them, but there's some wineries that do this because there's very similarity, a lot of similarity with Tuscany. Uh, and also Tempranillo, so a lot of similarity with Spain. We do some nice Tempranillo. Yeah, blends. so it's, it's, I think it's important to kind of point out that you don't just have to do Cab Merlot Chardonnay. There's, there's other grapes that can be grown in the United States. And, uh, and personally, I think that, and when you do grow Cab Merlot Chardonnay, I don't think that we can expect the Cabernet from California to taste like the Cabernet from Arizona or the one from uh, Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. uh, they should be different. Why wouldn't they be? So these are all good food wines. Uh, food yeah, is important is with our wines. Really nice. We actually um, have a tasting going on right now where these are the two reds, the Sangiovese and the Montepulciano, and we're recommending okay. them for Thanksgiving dinner. I can totally see that too. Um, I mean, you know, it's so it's really nice to get a Sangiovese from another part of the world, okay? Mm -hmm. Especially like Arizona. So, um, but there's this. You talk about Thanksgiving, and I kind of get this kind of cranberryish, uh -huh. uh, cranberryish like flavor on the palate. There's a um, cherries on steroids. Yeah, really. I think I, I actually think cherries on steroids is probably a better <laughs> a better example of that. Um, but. Uh, I can totally see that. There's also a, um, um, a smoothness to it, kind of a creaminess. You know, the, the tannins are very well contained. It's not, you know, Sangiovese doesn't tend to be super tannic like Cab anyway, but sometimes you you, you get into the, um, um, not the Rosso, but the Brunello de Montalcino sometimes mm -hmm. gets very, uh, gets more tannic than say a Chianti. Um, but sometimes Chianti's can get tannic, and this doesn't really have that, you know? We have a uh, Sangiovese called Kitsune, another 100% that we do uh, liken to uh, Rosso de Montalcino. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. This is very nice, you know, and um, I would definitely recommend it, you know, if you're, if you're here or you're going to the website, order it. Um, we didn't talk about it before, but I but I assume there's, you can ship to most states? Uh, probably about half of the half states. Half the states, yeah. Texas and, being one of them. Yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, it, a, lot, a lot of it is the, the shipping regulations to right. the particular state. So some states are easier to ship to than others and not as expensive to ship to than others. I know licensing uh, And is, some are impossible. Yeah, some are impossible, no matter what you do. Um, I know talking it, over the years, 
you know, some states are just, it's so prohibitive to, to ship there cost wise, it's why bother, you know? Uh -huh. you know, you know, in some places it's, like even Texas, there's a, there's some restrictions on how much you can ship to the state um, per person and some states don't have those restrictions. So right. check, check the website. I'm sure it'll tell you where you can ship to. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, the second one I poured here is called uh, Nagual del Marzo or okay. Spirit of Grandfather Marzo. Uh, Maynard discovered. Uh, My nickname is Mars. Oh, really? But the name Mark is derived from the god of war, Mars, and uh -huh. I actually do spell it with a Z because uh -huh. I have a friend of mine back in, in back in my Austin days who um, we would get on these pirate boards, and I said, "Well, what's your nickname?" He said Mars, and he spells it with a Z. I said, "You spelt it wrong." He goes, "Oh no, this is the cooler way to spell it." <laughs> so that's how I started using that spelling. But I've been using the Mars name. <laughs> For a long time, let's put it that way. Right. But well, um, so yeah, I'm already intrigued. <laughs> well, well, every bottle's uh, label uh, or name uh, refers back to something. Usually here at uh, Caduceus, uh, Marzo, and I have to check um, John Spirit, being the middle name, Marzo, um, great grandfather. I, I sometimes confuse it, grandfather or great grandfather. Right. But after uh, Maynard started making wine uh, back in 04 and was at it after a couple of years, uh, just happened coincidentally to get in touch with a long lost family member who said, Maynard, don't you remember your great grandfather Marzo made wine in Italy, right? Northwestern Italy, above Piedmont, um, near Turin, uh, back before the war. He didn't know anything about it. Here he was becoming a winemaker himself, not realizing that it was in the family blood all right. along. Um, he did make a trip over there and uh, contacted town officials, tried to find uh, genealogical history and uh, other types of history that led him to the very land that his grandfather had grown grapes on. I think he considered buying that land, but uh, right. it had a derelict farmhouse on it at the time. But I think that fell through for some reason. But, uh, so we have, you know, the Judith Vineyard up here in Jerome, named after his mom. Mm -hmm. This one named after a great grandfather, and so on. Uh, but uh, I also wanted to add that uh, a lot of people think that because uh, Maynard is involved uh, with the music industry and the head of three bands and busy with that for half of the year, I have to say that he is uh, first and foremost the one and only winemaker. Right. Uh, him, along with Jen, his wife, uh, spend the entire harvest season in their winery, which is within walking distance from here, a mile away. Right. Uh, they're working day and night. Uh, he's driving the forklift. Uh, he's doing it all. Uh, so he's he's definitely just not a figurehead. Um, he's the guy that does it and sweats over it. Yeah, and I think that's it, it is very important, and I think and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come here was because he wasn't the figurehead. Now oh, there's yeah. Yeah. lots of actors and musicians and whoever that they associate their, their name with um, an alcoholic product, you know, whether it's wine, right. vodka, or spirits, we'll just sure. generalize it. Spirits, wine, even mm -hmm. beers, and they have various levels of involvement. Some of them are just, it's just a name. It's just, they lent their name to it, or, or they're just associating themselves with a brand because it's, they're they're a hot commodity in the music industry, so they they decide to associate themselves with with a, a brand of spirit or something. Right. And then you have people like Maynard that, no, this is what they do. This is this is as much of his job as anything music wise, you know. And it is. And uh, it's it, it's something that I in I haven't been doing like long term research, but the research I have done because I'm like. Well, okay, no, really? This guy's a musician. Does, no, he does wine. And I right. think that's very important to point out that this is pretty much his, what he does. This is his baby. And then the music is what he does when he's not... To make the money to make yeah. the wine. <laughs> and, and, and this is this time of year is probably more for the mu music well, side of things. Well, he's sliding out of yeah. vineyard operations and thinking about going into creative endeavors again, yeah. probably in January. Right, so I think that's extremely important for people to understand that this is not just some, you know, millionaire's, you know, toy. 
it's 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 an actual living working and uh, it's what he does and he's you know you would think that why would he care but he is so uh, careful to make sure that the story gets told correctly yeah and, you know not fudging it this way or that right way, but saying I want people to know the story the right story yeah and so uh, I think that's what I've attempted to tell you today well and, and that has totally been my purpose coming here my purpose is not here to be a fanboy okay first and foremost I'm Thank a wine blogger. I'm a wine blogger okay I am I have a degree in music I understand music so yes I know what Maynard does musically um, I've listened to the music I, I can and I know um, very very well structured music and I have enjoyed some of it but that's not what I'm here I'm here to taste wine and that's I want people to understand that too and of course I want to I mean I think I, ex I expressed that to Chris when I talked to her in Austin that I could care less who the winemaker is. I mean, yeah, it's kind of cool. You know, that's cool. You know, Maynard's the winemaker. Okay, you got a musician making it, very, very well-known musician. But, you know, I think I wanted, the wine was good. If I didn't think the wine was good, because I had already tried it, I wouldn't have made a trip two hours out of Phoenix to come here, okay? <laughs> well, well uh, one of the comments I recently read on our Facebook page, uh, somebody commented, Maynard who? She said, the wine is the real story here. I don't yeah. care who made it. Just <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, the wine is good, and it's it's something that nobody in our industry, as far as the media side of the industry, really talks about. Yeah, there's people in the know. I mean, I'm sure if I you know if I would went to somebody in Wine Spectator, they would probably know. Yeah, they make wine in Arizona, but it's just it's something that's I seek out the new, the different, and the inter interesting. Um, that should be probably my tagline instead of your elite wine resource, right? But. Um, but it's that's what I look for. I look for stuff that's new, especially new to me. Mm -hmm. Things that are interesting. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. Jerome is. A, I never knew about this story. Jerome, Jerome is, is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you are fascinating. Oh, thank okay, you. this is, you are perfect for this. Okay, <laughs> um, you're a fascinating person. Um, the wine is fascinating. The story's fascinating. Yeah, main is fascinating. Okay, yeah, but the, the fact that we're making excellent wine here in the desert is why I really wanted to make that that effort to come up here yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway so back to the wine mm -hmm. uh, and in the Marzo I mean this is this is excellent wine too um, so it's lighter definitely you know it's, it's actually believe it or not to me it's lighter even though you've got you know a decent amount of cab in there um, but I think it was the, the Barbera is what really gives it that lightness too. I'll tell you what's going on with this wine. Uh, so if you had tasted the 2011, last okay. year's, um, it was probably slightly different blend, I don't recall, but it was very, very medium body, medium to light body mm -hmm. wine, uh, to the point of us not being completely satisfied with it in the beginning, although right. I have to say as a caveat, it became one of the best sellers out of the tasting room simply because it was lighter bodied. Right. But uh, it wasn't what Maynard had in mind. And so for, at this vineyard, uh, right, you know, proverbial stones throw away, about 16 miles away. What he's done is started some experimentation with different clones at the vineyard of the Sangiovese and uh, also with cropping, you know, uh, cropping down from, I believe it had started out at maybe three tons per acre. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've gone down to two tons per acre for this vintage. Oh wow. We're looking forward to the next vintage being uh, one and a half tons per acre. And at the same time, he's using uh, submerged cap fermentation okay. uh, right after this vintage. We're looking forward to this entirely new style of wine. We're hoping, uh, you know, more concentration of fruit, uh, more uh, relevant uh, to expressing the terroir, um, hopefully. Right. Uh, so we're looking for an even different wine in the next vintage than this. So I'm, I'm fascinated with, with the, that that tonnage, that ton per acre number, that oh. how low that is. I mean, right. that's that's pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean. It's amazing that you're 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 striving for that. It's I mean I, I wouldn't say it's probably too difficult to to accomplish in the environment, but you know to to purposely say we want that tonnage per acre is I think amazing. 
Right. Yeah. It's admirable. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. hopefully it'll be a worthwhile experiment. I'm sure it will. No, I'm, I'm very, I'm very pleased with the wine. Um, uh, it's you know another food wine. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of light, but I really, I think it's great. As a matter of fact, it's a wine that I could also just kind of kick back and just drink on its own. <laughs> you know, and I like. Right. I like all wine. Okay, mm -hmm. I like food wines. I like wines that are drinkable just on their own. I like quaffable wines. I like serious wines. Oh, sure. I haven't had any more white zin, so literally <laughs> I've never had white zin in my life. Uh, I probably have. Uh, Thirty, 30 <laughs> years ago or so. There's there's a bottle where, where I do where I do normally record this at the house. They have a, a small wine rack. No, I don't have a huge wine collection. I don't. But there's a bottle of white zin sitting there, <laughs> just going. I dare you to review me. And one day I will. It'll probably be bad at that point because it's pretty old. Maybe you should pull it out for Thanksgiving because the whole idea of the Actually, holidays. Actually, you know what? Why not? Yeah. Keep your aunt Ida happy. That'll that'll yeah, satisfy exactly. her and everybody. Stress free holiday. Yeah. <laughs> but I have a feeling this wise it might not be showing too well because I think it's like a, I don't know a 2008 or 2007. <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty old. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, enough of that. Um, so I poured you some uh, of the Montepulciano, another yes. uh, wine club selection. 100% uh, Montepulciano. Uh, yeah. This is from an aged 18 months. Okay. A neutral French oak. And this is from your uh, New Mexico. And uh, this is from the New Mexico vineyard. Right. Luna Rosa, which maybe you'll be able to stop by on your way home. Uh, Paolo and Sylvia are the owners. Very sweet people. Uh, yeah. So, as I was telling you earlier, even though we have uh, quite a few acreage of vineyards of our own, uh, we're still sourcing from the one other vineyard in New Mexico uh, right. to, to round out our needs. You know, there'll be some point in the future where we let go of this because we won't need it anymore. Right. Because our, our idea is to be uh, totally focused on our own Arizona vineyards. Uh, not that, you know, good grapes aren't grown elsewhere but that's just their idea to be local as we can right and you know this is an excellent wine too um it's also nice and light i could totally just sip on this and i get a little bit of i mean using this word a little more recently brambliness you know um do you want to write my tasting notes <laughs> You know, I probably could do a better job than some of these people, but then again, I may not be <coughs> artistically flowing. I might be a little too, cut, I'm sometimes very cut and dry with my stuff, uh, despite being a musician too. Um, I kind of sometimes I'm cut, I'm kind of dry, but um, uh, this is excellent. And but you know, to, to talk about uh, talk about that, I mean. Um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with having the wines, and, and it's labeled New Mexico. Right. So, Texas winemakers, make note of that. <laughs> we had a little discussion about the for sale in Texas only stuff. I mean, that's because they're not putting this from California. So, New Mexico, don't be afraid to to say that your your grapes came from somewhere else, and you're making world class wine with it. You still have to make the wine. That's true. Yeah. You know, that's so what you do with yeah, it? Yeah. It's it's not it's not that it's not that you know they made it in New Mexico and then you just trucked it over here and bottled it, you, you're making it here, you know, so. Speaking of tasting notes, I, uh, something we didn't discuss but that just came up this morning in a conversation with Maynard is that uh, he's uh, trying to take better and better uh, notes in the winery as far as fermentations, what went on. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you try to figure out something that went on with one of our wines from 2008 you'd be hard pressed to find any notes about it anywhere because he's not a very good note taker i'd be that but, way too <laughs> but uh, one of the things that he mentioned that he was doing this morning and i was so happy to hear is that uh, they're making note of the music that they're listening to in oh, the winery cool. as they ferment whatever wine so that's going to go down into the official notes uh, as part of the whatever that wine is about because that's the music they were listening to well in in speaking of music the music you play here is fantastic <laughs> okay i mean it, it runs the wide yeah, yeah wide ranging i mean literally it, it, it is it feels like you're listening to somebody's collection and they just said shuffle you know that's, instead that's it, what we're doing <laughs> yeah instead of instead of like a particular you know style because we've heard everything from blues, old blues, to, well, I, would say, I say heavy metal, but metal, um, to um, uh, new wave, to pop, to alternative, to 
Well, uh, you know, everything, you know? <laughs> we tried an experiment here where we, we let each of the staff members bring in their own music. Right. And uh, it didn't work because Maynard would come in and say, that's not what the wine is about. I was not listening to that music when right. I made that wine. Yes. And so he's very adamant about controlling the playlist. It's his music. It's the music that he listened to while winemaking. Right. So. And you know what? That's another thing. I think just musicians in general, when people, you know, when people, they, they, they play a certain style of music and a lot of times they, they stick to one type of style and I think people forget that musicians listen to all kinds of music they just sometimes play a particular style or maybe a couple different styles you know I've musician friends throughout the years and you know they play one they with one style of music yet they're listening to things you would never you just you don't think are what they would listen to but that's right. how they learn they you know they, they do get influences from all styles of music you know and, and it's it's something to remember when you talk about musicians they listen to a lot of different things you know not just what they play <laughs> right well occasionally you know as one of the staff members here if there's a a concert venue that Maynard is playing that happens to be close by, say yeah. Phoenix, which is 100 miles away. Uh, well, we'll get a free ticket, and so we'll go. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't go. Yeah. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, for whatever reason. But uh, one of the most surprising things to me at one of those concerts that I attended, you know, where Maynard was the headliner, was that when I went in, beautiful sound system playing the sound of music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, of all things, I was shocked. <laughs> yeah, and, and that I think you know that's also cool. You know, like when I've gone to concerts, I don't go to a lot, but you will you will sometimes hear that. You know, the the headliner is playing stuff that they probably listen to on the bus. You know, or what they like to listen to, and it's a completely different style of music. Right. You know, and it's refreshing because I'm already going to hear their stuff. I don't need to hear more of their stuff. Right. That's true. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. so. This is awesome. I love all these wines. Um, very happy you, you chose these, and I, I'm just ex excited and ecstatic that you're able to spend some time with me. Um, it's been fascinating. It was a pleasure listening. for me yeah. too. Fascinating hearing all the stories about uh, Jerome and about you know hearing the history of the winery and yourself, and uh, meeting the other people that work here with you. And, uh, and also being able to see it. Like, here's a, another cool thing about this we didn't talk about. Place opens at 8 in the morning, right? Uh huh. Yeah, right. eight, 8 in the morning. 8 in the morning. Uh -huh. So from 8 till 11, espresso. Best espresso in town, right? Uh, I believe so. You've been making it for how many how many years? Myself, over, <laughs> over well over 20. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, was it Alan, the other gentleman I met? Alan. For a couple maybe years. Maybe 30 years. Maybe a couple years longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um,. So I, I don't. I'm not a coffee drinker, but my dad had the coffee. He didn't complain about it, so it must have been pretty good. Um, and, and trust me, if my dad don't like something, he's going to tell you. I believe that. Yeah, he, he will. He will nice tell guy. you. Um, so excellent coffee here, and got some little bit of stuff to nibble on and stuff like that. So uh, check it out. Uh, beautiful wine shop or tasting room, really, but beautiful shop in here. Lots of stuff to buy. So if you're in the area, I highly encourage you to stop in, check out some world-class wine. That are being made here in Arizona, and uh, check out the place, and uh, maybe chat Brian up a little bit about about the about the area, and um, please do. Yeah, check it out. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a cool little place, and the scenery's nice. Driving Drama's through, lovely. Drama's yeah, driving lovely. through Arizona and driving up here is is, is really great. Mm -hmm. So um, we're gonna go and wrap this up. The sun's about to blind him. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, we're gonna wrap this up. As always, folks, I want to thank everybody for stopping by. Um, hit the link below. I'll have the link for um, Caduceus, so you can check it out. How to get here? How to order the wines online? Um, friend me up above uh, throughout the, the world of the internets and the tubes. Uh, again, I'm not pointing at Brian. Every every interview, I do the same thing. Oh. Um, <laughs> over here, there's a PayPal button. If you want to hit it, hit that button. Donate a couple dollars. That'd be great, and um, we will see everyone again next time. Thank you very much. Okay. I absolutely appreciate it. Thank you. All right. See ya.